The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. I'd like to welcome you this morning to the market and to this Abney breakfast um, for what promises to be a great talk about technology and its importance in the growth uh, of New York City. The report we'll discuss really focuses on the impact of technology in New York today and in the future. Um, with that, I'll introduce Bill Rudin. There's no better advocate for New York City and, and no, no one who understands uh, infrastructure better. And with that, I'll introduce Bill. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. And yes, you, Jamestown, you guys were visionaries. There's no question about it. Your uh, forward-thinking investment here in the 1990s uh, really set a benchmark and we wish you good luck as you uh, work your way through the zoning and EULA process to expand your vision and really help grow the industry. So congratulations to Jamestown. Wish them good luck. The emergence of the tech center as a primary driver of New York City's economy is just the latest phase of our city recreating itself. Throughout New York's history we have dominated industries national and international from advertising, trade, manufacturing, fashion, media. Uh, and as you will learn from our panel of experts this morning, New York is well situated to become a leading player in the tech center for generations to come. It is now my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Bowles. Jonathan, thank you. Good luck. I'm really pleased to be here to have a, a discussion about the report that the Center for an Urban Future published uh, with Abney and AT&T called New Tech City. For years and years, New York has been looking for that magic bullet for how do you diversify the city's economy? How do you kind of add balance? Uh, obviously, Wall Street remains as important as ever, but how do you add balance to this economy? And it's been, a, it's been, it's been challenging. Uh, you know, to Seth's credit, this uh, Bloomberg administration has been has done so many things to try to do this, but with the tech sector, I think New York finally has this legitimate shot of, of diversifying its economy. I think the best thing, though, is that through tons of research that we did, talking to people inside and outside of New York, that there's something different about this tech turnaround in the last several years. That this is not a flash in the pan, that New York is really building something sustainable, something lasting with its tech sector. It's my theory is it's a little bit like the evolution of, of man there needs to be a primordial soup, right? And within that primordial soup, you need a variety of factors because there were a bunch of ge geographies where they, these entrepreneurial centers could have started, right? They, <clears throat> they sort of popped up in uh, Seattle, in Atlanta, in Austin, Texas, and they really haven't fully taken hold like they had here in New York. And I think the reason it really finally did take uh, hold here in New York were a few things. First, from the technology side, um, the ability to have everything in the cloud made a real difference in terms of allowing people ge geographically to, to be situated anywhere. Uh, secondly, in terms of having uh, software open source, uh, also made it much easier for programmers not have to be focused in one specific geographic area. You know, the third main reason is management, because I can tell you, even 10 years ago, when you were looking for a sophisticated manager, the CEOs in New York were, all, were, were for the most part, first-time CEOs. And you were putting them, and they were competing against Silicon Valley CEOs who'd been second and third time CEOs of startup companies. And until you've had the experience of running one of those companies, <clears throat> you're, you're, it's just hard to compete against somebody because it's an apprenticeship business. So the management has, you know, just from the sake of time, really pushed it forward. Um, <clears throat> I guess that, <clears throat> sorry about this. <clears throat> I guess I should have had more coffee this morning. Um, one other large issue would be uh, the number of engineers. Because in order to have a successful uh, ecosystem, you need management, you need engineers, and the fact that so many large companies like Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, et cetera, and now obviously Facebook and eBay have large uh, staffs of engineers here, have made that available for people as well. So a combination of those, and when you have management <clears throat> and you have deals, you're going to have funding. So now obviously all the venture capitalists have become interested because so many interesting deals are here. So it's just a completely different ecosystem than it was 10 years ago. And it's a completely self-fulfilling ecosystem as well. But right now, people want to be here. They want to be in New York because they want to be close to their customers. Because New York really is the center of media, advertising, publishing, financial services, and retail. So since you have the other factors that allow you to start companies here, it's become a fantastic place to start. 
I want to go to Jalik next because Jalik, you know, you were at the investment fund kind of rustling with a lot of these issues, I think, trying to make sure that there was capital in the city, trying to make sure that we did kind of build this ecosystem. And, and that wasn't very long ago. This wasn't 1994. This was, what, 2008 or so, yeah, right? It was, uh, 2007 to uh, 2010. I think the other thing we're, we're seeing here is uh, uh, the number of repeat entrepreneurs. Um, and if you look at some of the tech sectors that Stuart just referenced, uh, Silicon Valley, Seattle, um, you have entrepreneurs who have not been afraid to take the risk, start companies, fail, start another company. You know, the, this, uh, this, this notion of serial entrepreneurship. And um, I didn't see it, a lot of that, in, in New York in uh, 2007, 2008. And then what happened with the financial crash of 2008, a, a lot of people didn't have any other option. Uh, those engineers that would have gone to Wall Street didn't go to Wall Street. Uh, they they uh, linked up with uh, you know, business folks and started their own companies, and, and some of them are already on their second um, uh, company. And, and so, you know, that, that really seeds the ecosystem. It's this culture of, of not being afraid to, to fail, and, and, and then I think a lot of what the Bloomberg administration has done to support, you know, these entrepreneurs in terms of uh, space and, and programs, uh, and then also what Brad's done with General Assembly have been, have been key elements of, of that. What kind of companies are we seeing here in, in New York's startup tech sector? Sure. Thanks, Jonathan. So um, General Assembly was actually started about um, a, a year and a half ago now. Um, and we really started as a community space for the technology ecosystem in New York. Um, and as we started, you know, we were, uh, we were full from the day we opened in terms of startups and individuals and, and people that were really interesting from an economic perspective and from a technology perspective working out of the space. And those ranged, ranged from B2C companies, people who were building interesting consumer technologies on the web and on mobile, um, especially to B2B companies, companies who were creating new kinds of technologies to sell into enterprise, to sell into small and medium-sized businesses, and to sell into other sectors of the economy. Um, what we really noticed shortly after opening is that the biggest barrier to the growth of these companies actually wasn't space, it, it wasn't capital, it was talent. And it was skills. And I think um, both Stuart and Jalak have really touched on this issue in talking about the, ex the experience of the entrepreneurs in the ecosystem. And also the number of engineers that are present as really being determining factors for the growth of a technology ecosystem. So as we grew the business, we really focused on education and trying to both from an entrepreneurial perspective, kind of promulgate those, those skills and those best practices for how to start a business. Because it's not necessarily just about having engineers, it's also about having engineers who understand rapid prototyping, agile development, lean user experience, kind of these concepts that might not be useful at you know, writing Java code at an investment bank, but are incredibly useful if you want to build a successful technology company. On the flip side, there's simply a volume question of the number of engineers and the number of talented designers who are in the technology ecosystem. And we've also really focused on addressing that question through running skills and training programs in these kind of core talent areas of technology, specifically engineering and design. Great. Uh, thanks, Brad. And um, Kathy, you know, one of the things we heard in our research was that uh, one of New York's advantages, uh, or one of the reasons why New York has done well is that kind of the explosion of smart devices, mobile technology uh, has been, um, has really played to New York's strengths in, in a way. And so I'm just curious, you know, uh, how are you seeing mobile as kind of impacting the, the tech sector and the startup community in New York? Yeah, well, I think absolutely that's the enablement capability. I mean, mobile devices and tablets, they have revolutionized our world. You can be anywhere, anywhere and you can access your content wherever you happen to be. We also have seen that technology trends have been guided by developers who are not just working on hardware, but applications and solutions that can help make businesses run more effectively. And so what we see at at and through our labs organization and our focus on innovation is many of the content developers are focusing on solutions that make your application work better. And they don't have to be in Silicon Valley or in Boston. And an environment like New York City is a perfect location for those kind of kids. 
At at and we're also working on sponsoring developer conferences as well as focusing on the youth because it's all about talent management. We have to make kids want to stay in New York after they graduate from college, and we have to show them a climate for business that really makes it cool to be in New York. So we've actually sponsored some activities where we've actually brought kids in to make fast pitches to make a cash prize if they actually are successful. We see that as another area of opportunity for at and to help bring these guys in as a talent pool for our company in the future because we have a great labs organization that focuses on development. Great. Now, Seth, um, you know, how is this kind of growing tech sector um, helping to create jobs, to create kind of momentum for the overall economy? Well, I think if you just look at the, the sheer numbers, you can understand the impact that the sector in and of itself is having on the city's economy. Um, I mean, the definitions of what constitutes the tech sector vary. Um, if you take the broadest definition, um, you could argue that over 120,000 people in New York are employed today in the tech sector, making it one of the largest employers in the city. Um, and this is something that has happened almost overnight. Um, we estimate that in the last five years or so, the number of people employed in that sector has increased by nearly 30 percent, um, which is an incredible growth rate. But I think that the real impact that this sector is having on the city is not just within the tech sector as strictly defined, um, but it requires, I think, people to change the way that they view the sector. because. I think in the past, and, and to me this is what really explains the growth of the sector in New York, in the past when people thought of the tech sector, it was a sector that was distinct from other sectors in the economy. Increasingly, the tech sector is the economy. Every aspect of our economy is being touched by technology. And one of the reasons why we're so focused on the tech sector uh, in the Bloomberg administration is that we recognize that if New York wants to remain a leader economically, it doesn't just need an active and growing tech sector. It needs to have a technologically savvy sector uh, across the entire economy. Finance, fashion, uh, media, all of these sectors are going to have to become, in a sense, technology sectors if they want to compete and survive. It's great. I mean, and, and I, I urge you, if you haven't already, to check out the, the New Tech City report because it talks about just that and how New York has positioned itself so well in things like fashion tech, fintech, digital media, um, you know, health tech, and all of these other tech sectors that are really, you know, technology disrupting traditional industries. Um, I, I just want to, um, uh, you know, ask now what. What's the future hold for New York? I think that we kind of have a positive take in, in, our, in our study, but what do you see? Is New York well positioned going forward for this? This is really open to anybody on the panel. Um, not only is New York well positioned, but, but why? So I think uh, New York continues to be um, one of the prime places where uh, young people want to come, and this is an industry that is um, really driven by the energy of young people with new ideas who understand these technologies. Um, I think also that the increasing move from uh, pure technology to what we call dash tech, whether it's fintech, fashion tech, et cetera, uh, plays into New York's strengths because um, even if in the past we weren't necessarily the leader on the right side of the dash, on the tech side, um, we have always been a leader on the left side of the dash, and increasingly with the investments that are being made by our universities, and I see representatives of a number of the universities around the room, um, I think we're really giving other regions of the country a run for the money on both the left and the right side of the dash. I think, though, at the same time, we do have to be realistic. I mean, the tech sector, like all sectors, is inevitably going to go through cycles. And I don't think that um, just because uh, we go through a downturn in the, in the sector that that uh, needs to cause alarm. Um, I think, in fact, if you look back to um, the last uh, growth in the tech sector, uh, the uh, dot-com era, uh, what a lot of people, the, the common narrative is it grew incredibly large and then it disappeared. But in fact, it didn't disappear. Um, if you look at a lot of the companies today, many of them are led by people who came out of that first era. And similarly, the same thing will happen going forward, coming out of this era. But I do think that over the long run, um, the trend is a positive one for New York. And we think that with these investments, uh, as well as ensuring that the city remains a magnet for talent, uh, that the future for New York is bright. 
I think that the opportunity for us is to continue to maintain that excitement about New York. I think there's no place more exciting in the country and the world than New York City. I see the talent pool very robust and very opportunistic. I'd like to see more kids staying in science and technology, but the opportunity is there for us to retain the talent. I think it's more about giving them an, a reason to stay. And there's clearly access to capital here, and there's venture capital in New York, and more so than many other places in the world. So it's up to us to provide a business environment that it excites the students, and it keeps them through graduation and allows them to live here. Because part of the challenge of living in New York is the expense. And for kids right out of college, unless our parents are paying for it, it's pretty tough. Uh, but I think right now the market is very robust economically from a business perspective and clearly from a political momentum perspective. New York has a lot of cachet and people all want to come to New York. When I talk to our college graduates, everyone wants a, jo a job in New York City. So for us, it's about keeping them here. There's an old anecdote in investing that it usually takes uh, 20 years to develop a market. It's 10 years to basically have the market developed and then 10 years where you actually make the money. If you look at dot-com 1.0, really started right around two, you know, 99, 2000, 2001. And of the things we discussed before, which were entrepreneurs and engineers and sort of an ecosystem of venture capital, all those things were a little bit of fits and starts. I mean, it, the truth of the matter is, because I've been around since the, the first Web 1.0, it grew up a little bit too quickly. A lot of the companies had inexperienced CEOs. Uh, a lot of the companies didn't have business models. I mean, it, it was, uh, by all respects, and historically over the last couple hundred years, it was a bubble. Things got significantly overvalued. Post that, things were significantly undervalued. It was like everything, it seemed like anything was worth everything, and then everything was worth nothing. But the smart people, and what you can see is the entrepreneurs, they kept developing companies and working on technologies. And obviously, you know, with, like I said, with everything becoming available in the cloud and the entrepreneurs continuing to start companies and creating real revenues and figuring out how to monetize these large user bases, these companies are significantly more solid companies. So if you look at each of the aspects that we looked at before, there are better and more experienced entrepreneurs here now. There are better and more experienced and more venture capitalists here now. There are better entrepreneurial talent pools here now. So, and, but the most important thing is what all my colleagues have said, which is it all depends on where the smartest graduates are coming. Literally 10 years ago, it was the rare bird who was a very sort of bright, intelligent, either engineer or entrepreneur who didn't move to Silicon Valley. And part of that was because they went to the great venture capitalists like Kleiner Perkins and Vinod Kosla, and Vinod would say, I will fund you if you move to within 20 miles of my office. That no longer happens, and that no longer happens because the entrepreneurs can, can reasonably say, I want to stay in New York because New York is where all these pools of talent are, and New York is where I can be closer to my customers. And because great companies have started to be formed in New York, now the other venture capitalists want to invest in New York City. So the way I look at it from all respects, New York is on a fantastic trajectory. This is not a sort of got run up too quickly. This is a place where the foundation, I guess, given the real estate background of people in the audience, the foundation has been built since 1999. And now we're reaping the rewards of having built a solid foundation. What I see happening in New York is very similar to what I saw in the Valley in, in that 99 time period. And it's not about necessarily the valuations. It's really the energy. Uh, around the sector uh, with entrepreneurs, uh, with supporting industries. Uh, and so, you know, when I came back and decided where do I want to launch a new venture fund, I mean, it was a no-brainer for me to do it in New York because it's still a very nascent market. Um, but I really believe that the future of uh, technology, uh, because we're looking at applications and, and mobility, all these things, you know, that New York is, is just... So, such a great test bed for, um, it is re really the reason New York is going to grow in the future. And, and I also believe, uh, if you look at globalization trends, and I've invested around the world, um, I mean, New York geographically is just very well positioned versus the valley. I mean, to go, you know, to go to India or to go to Europe from the valley or even Brazil or um, Africa, which I invested in last year, um, those, those are long trips with, with uh, significant time differences, and New York already has such a diverse community of people here, of talent, um, as well as being very well geographically positioned. So, um, you know, I think as far as the U.S., there's no place, uh, you know, I would rather be investing right now than, than New York. 
Brad, uh, but also then to the rest of the panel, um, if the foundations are strong, I think we agree on that, but what, what worries you about the future of New York? Because you know, things can change on a dime in this sector, and, um, and I'm just curious with the, the entrepreneurs that are coming out, out of uh, General Assembly uh, or the, the, the companies that you're seeing, you know, uh, are there concerns that you have, things that might hold back the future growth of this sector? Sure. Well, uh, a couple of things. One, I think, you know, as, as Seth noted, um, we're at the, you know, the high level of a cycle right now, and there is a secular trend in the growth of technology, specifically in New York, but also around the world. Um, and um, I want to make sure things like this happen when we're not at the top of a cycle, and that the acknowledgement of that secular trend continues and people still look at tech as interesting and as compelling and as a job creator um, when we're at the bottom of a cycle like we were back in 2008. So I think that's one side. The other side is really the cultivation of talent and making sure that companies that are coming out of universities, companies that are coming out of other industries, out of finance, out of advertising, have the talent they need to grow. Um, one of the biggest reasons that companies leave other cities and move to Silicon Valley or move to New York or move to Boston is because of a lack of talent in those secondary markets. I started an uh, a internet company in uh, 2006 in Connecticut and moved to New York in 2008 because there simply wasn't enough talent to grow the company. We couldn't hire engineers, we couldn't hire designers. So making sure that that talent shortage doesn't happen again and doesn't continue um, is incredibly important to the growth of tech. Um, I also think that it's important to think about a couple of different concepts um, when one thinks about the future of technology in New York. One is um, securing what I refer to as magnets, uh, the sorts of things, uh, institutions that will remain constant even through the cycles of the industry. Um, and a lot of people think of those institutions primarily as universities, which is obviously something that the mayor has been very focused on. We've um, had great partnerships with a number of the universities, mostly universities that are currently located in the city, um, which fortunately um, are being led increasingly by um, individuals who recognize the importance of uh, investing in science and engineering and training the talent that's necessary for the next generation. Um, and of course, we're also excited about the new entrants who are coming in, whether it's Cornell and the Technion on Roosevelt Island, um, or the Center for um, uh, Urban uh, Science and Progress that NYU is leading with an international consortium in downtown Brooklyn or elsewhere. Um, so I think those kinds of magnets are very important. I also think, though, that we need to look at magnets like uh, large companies that are started in New York, as well as large companies from outside of New York that are making significant commitments to the city. Um, and being in this building, um, I think, is appropriate uh, because we are right across the street from one of the most important magnets in the city, which is Google, uh, which invested $2 billion on a new headquarters, actually has space in this building as well, um, and is uh, a major uh, a draw for talent. I think today they have nearly 3,000 employees in the city. So the magnets are, are one piece of it. I think a second piece of it, and it's appropriate that Commissioner Kelly is here, um, is continuing to make New York a place that is desirable to the best and the brightest. Um, and that uh, includes things like investments in amenities. We have the High Line going right over our heads. Um, that has been um, an incredible draw to people in this neighborhood, um, but also keeping our city safe. One of the ways that um, our young people have been able to afford to live in New York is that there are more neighborhoods that are now open to them uh, to live in, that they would consider uh, thinking about locating their businesses and their homes in that in the past they never would have thought about. Um, and that's a very important part of the puzzle for the future of the city. We really need to make sure that, yes, while we're, we're cultivating talent, homegrown talent here, we need to keep our borders uh, open for uh, talent elsewhere. And I think it becomes even more important if you look at, again, globalization trends. And a startup that starts in the U.S. can no longer just focus as a U.S. as its market. Uh, it needs to focus on, on, on the world, and, and diversity uh, will, uh, you, you know, will help breed success for these companies. Um, and there are a lot of other countries that are being very welcoming to, uh, to, to immigrant entrepreneurs. 
And then the other is at the other end of the spectrum, it's, it's, um, we've talked a lot about university education, but in, but in New York, you know, making sure that we're, the, the, the primary and secondary education is, is strong and, and uh, we're reaching out into you know, all of the boroughs, uh, not just Manhattan, and, and making sure that uh, the digital divide does not grow and that all, all students are given um, you know, access to technology uh, as well as the tools to develop their own technologies. We've established a program called Aspire, which is really a national program that's intended to be targeted toward high schools around the country, but particularly in New York, to provide funding for students to stay in high school. I took a walk around here this morning just to see the neighborhood because it's where my father grew up. And he was a product of the New York public school system and had a great education. But not all the kids have the environment to live in that in fact allows them to be the best they can be. And so we need to keep kids in school, we need to show them a future, and we need to have the ability for them to understand that being in a company or being in technology or being in science and math is a cool thing to do, not to become a victim of the environment that sometimes might be problematic to them and might be not the easiest path for them to take to stay in school. So for me, and for AT&T in particular, what worries us most is really a qualified workforce that really is capable of really taking our country to the next level. This city, more than any I've ever seen, is so focused on wanting this industry to succeed and for there to be an alternative to financial services in New York City that I, I, I am not particularly worried. I mean, the only thing I really worry about is General Assembly running out of space because that's where all the really cool companies want to go. Are there things that the larger business community, are there things that the real estate community in New York could, could be doing to kind of keep this going? Yes, that, that is the one thing I would say is if you look right now, the, the pr primarily the companies that have been successful in New York City are the consumer companies. But if you look at Boston and Silicon Valley, there's always been a mixture of enterprise software companies as well. Enterprise software companies are those that sell to large corporations. It costs more to start up enterprise software companies than it does to start up consumer companies. If you look at what's going on in Silicon Valley with the valuations of a variety of enterprise software companies being purchased and companies like Workday going public and Cloudera probably going public, um, I think given the fact that we have such a, a large number of Fortune 500 here in New York City, enterprise software is going to become increasingly important. What would be important is to make sure that we have some way for the small fledgling enterprise companies here in New York City to make sure that they have access to those Fortune 500 companies that are located in the city and have the ability to get in at the senior levels to show their wares. Because it's easy, not easy, but it's easier for a consumer company to launch an app and it, for, it, for it to become viral, right? So draw something launched from OMG Pop, which was a New York City company, went to 10 million users in, in 14 days, if, I, if I'm correct. But when an enterprise software company has created something for financial services companies, they have to go through sort of the technology purchasing in the CTO's office. So anything that this group, this you know, sort of esteemed group of senior executives could do to make sure that the small New York companies that are trying to sell to large corporations have the access and ability to do so, I think would continue to help our ecosystem significantly. We, working with General Assembly and others, as well as others completely independent of the administration, um, set up an, a broad network of, of incubators. The, the network that EDC is affiliated with today has space for something like a thousand businesses over the next three years. I think, um, though that problem certainly hasn't been solved, it's been at least uh, addressed. Um, the next problem that we noticed as these businesses have grown is uh, the need for step out space. Um, where does a company go when it's now too large to be in a facility like General Assembly or elsewhere, um, but still has uh, pressure on, uh, has, uh, faces financial pressures and you can't necessarily afford traditional New York real estate? And making sure uh, both that there's appropriate space available, um, and that includes uh, being wired appropriately, but also space where landlords understand how these businesses work and their needs, I think is a, a critical next step. I hope that the real estate community is focusing on is looking out five years, ten years um, with these larger, more mature companies, making sure that there's space that's appropriate for them because it's not going to be exactly the kind of space that I think we often associate with the technology sector in New York. And I think that that's a longer lead time item that I hope that the real estate industry is focused on. This is a great panel. You know you've had a successful morning and Jonathan and the panelists you guys were incredible. I think we owe them a, a tremendous round of applause.